number three, Antoinette Frank. In the fall of 1994, 24-year-old Antoinette Frank was a rookie on the New Orleans Police Department. On the night of November 15th, she responded to the report of a shooting. One of the victims was 18-year-old Rogers Lacaze. Lacaze was a drug dealer, and he and a friend were shot by one of his customers. Both Lacaze and his friend survived the shooting. As Lacaze recovered in the hospital, Antoinette paid him visits. After he got out of the hospital, Antoinette bought him a cell phone, expensive clothes, and she even rented him a Cadillac. She also let him ride around in her squad car while she was on duty. She even let him drive the police car on a few occasions. When Antoinette introduced Lacaze to other people, she said that he was her trainee. Besides working for the police department, Antoinette also picked up extra money filling in shifts, working security at the Kim On restaurant, which was a family-owned Vietnamese restaurant in East New Orleans. Antoinette didn't work too often as a security guard because the person who oversaw security at the restaurant, another officer with the New Orleans Police Department named Ronald Williams, didn't trust her. He usually only called her in if he was desperate. On the night of March 4, 1995, Antoinette and Lacaze came into the restaurant twice to get food. At around 1.50 a.m., the restaurant closed. Inside the restaurant were Ronald Williams, who was working security, four of the restaurant's owner's children, Chow, Kwok, Kong, and Havu, and another restaurant employee named Vui. Just after the restaurant closed, Antoinette came to the door of the restaurant and tried to open it, but it was locked. Chow Vu had a bad feeling, so she collected all the money in the restaurant and hid it in a microwave. Williams wasn't too worried about Antoinette getting into the restaurant because the door was locked. He was surprised when Antoinette pulled out a set of keys and let herself into the restaurant. A set of keys went missing earlier in the evening, but no one had realized that Antoinette had stolen them on one of her earlier visits to the restaurant. Once Antoinette was in the restaurant, she started yelling and pushed Chow, Kwok, and Vui into the back of the restaurant. While they were in the back, they heard a gunshot and Antoinette ran to the front of the restaurant. What they heard was Lacaze shooting Officer Williams. As the married father of two laid on the ground, Antoinette stood over him and fired several more rounds into him. When Antoinette left the back of the restaurant to kill her fellow officer, Chow, Kwok, and Vui hid in the restaurant's freezer. While in the freezer, they watched through a window in the freezer's door as Antoinette and Lacaze searched for the money. After Antoinette found the money in the microwave, she shot 17-year-old Kong and 24-year-old Ha as they kneeled on the floor. When the shooting stopped and everything was quiet, Kwok opened the door of the freezer. He didn't see Antoinette or Lacaze, so he ran out of the freezer. As he ran through the restaurant, he passed the dead bodies of his brother and sister. He ran to a friend's home and called 911. The police arrived at the restaurant shortly afterward, and Antoinette, who was off duty and out of uniform, showed up at the restaurant as well. When Chow saw that the police had arrived, she ran outside and was startled to see Antoinette there. Antoinette went up to Chow and she asked her what happened. Chow got away from Antoinette and told another officer that Antoinette was the one who performed the robbery. Antoinette was arrested and they found a gun in the waistband of her pants. They concluded that after stealing the money, Antoinette drove Lacaze home and that she was going to come back to the restaurant to kill the other witnesses. She was surprised to find that her fellow officers had already arrived on scene. Lacaze was arrested at his apartment. 
Antoinette and Lacaze were both convicted of the three murders and they were sentenced to death. In November 1995, a month after Antoinette was sentenced to death, her house was searched. Some human bones were found buried beneath it. The bones belonged to a man and the skull had a bullet wound. The bones weren't identified, but it's believed that they belonged to her father. Antoinette had reported her father missing a year and a half before the mass murder at the restaurant. Since Antoinette was already sitting on death row, not much effort was put into identifying the bones, but it's believed that the remains belonged to her father. Antoinette Frank is still on death row, and currently, she is the only woman on death row in Louisiana. Her execution date was last set for December 2008, but it was cancelled, and a new execution date has yet to be set. Lacaze has been appealing his convictions. He claims that he is innocent, and he wasn't involved in the robbery. He says that at the time of the shooting, he was at a pool hall. His lawyers say someone else, quite possibly Antoinette's brother, Adam Frank, was really Antoinette's accomplice in the shooting. Adam Frank has always denied being involved in the deadly robbery, and no evidence ties him to the crime scene. In October 2017, it was announced that the Louisiana Supreme Court would hear Lacaze's case. He was granted a retrial shortly afterward. But then a month later, that decision was reversed and the retrial was denied. His sentence has since been changed from a death sentence to a life sentence. Today, Rogers Lacaze sits in prison maintaining his innocence. Number 2. Tor Hedin. On the night of November 28, 1951, the police were called to a house fire in Chornay, Sweden. Local police officer, 24-year-old Tor Hedin, was one of the first officers to arrive at the crime scene. The home belonged to a 32-year-old miller named John Allen Nielsen. He was found inside the burned out house with an axe buried in his chest. The killer then splashed gasoline on the body and around the house and then he struck a match as he walked out. Nielsen was killed after hosting a poker game and the money was missing so robbery was the most likely motive. Hedina never worked on a murder case before but he vowed to bring the killer to justice. Several times, Hedin answered questions from the media about the case. This photograph, which was taken by a photographer with a local newspaper, shows Hedin taking notes at the crime scene. An eyewitness said that they saw a man wearing some type of uniform riding a bike near the crime scene just before the fire started. Hundreds of people who lived in the area and wore uniforms like rail and postal employees were interviewed. When the interviews didn't turn up any leads, Hedin asked a psychic for help. But nothing he did led to the killer being identified. People living in the area had no idea that the person who hacked to death Nielsen was the very person who was investigating the murder, Tor Hedin. The murder of Nielsen wasn't his first serious crime. When Hedin was 16, he broke into a brewery to steal some oats. To hide the evidence of the robbery, he set the brewery on fire. While investigating the murder of Nielsen, Hedin got engaged to Eula Osberry. But in July of 1952, just a few months into the engagement, Osberry broke it off. She had come to fear Hedin because he was physically abusive. On August 20th, Hedin went to the nursing home where Osbury worked to exchange some personal belongings. At first, they talked pleasantly, but then Hedin snapped. He started yelling at her, so she started yelling back. He then tried to get her to be quiet by stuffing his gloves and then a handkerchief in her mouth. This only made Osbury angrier, 
so Hadin pulled out a pair of handcuffs and locked them on her wrists. When she was handcuffed, Osbury threatened to kill her. Hadin spent the night with Osbury in one of the employee bedrooms in the nursing home. Osbury remained handcuffed all night. In the morning, one of her co-workers reported the incident to a doctor who in turn contacted one of Hadin's superiors on the police force. Hadin was fired immediately. That night, just before midnight, Hadin drove to his parents' home in Stora Haria. He entered their home as they slept. Using an axe, he hacked them to death and then set the house on fire. He then drove to the nursing home where Osbury was working an overnight shift. He managed to get inside the nursing home and he found his 24-year-old ex-fiance sleeping in a room with her boss, 55-year-old Agnes Lunden. He hacked both women to death with his axe. After both women were dead, just like he did at every other one of his crime scenes, Hedin started a fire. Unfortunately, this time, there were people still alive at the crime scene, 17 elderly people in all. Three women and one man died in the fire, and another woman died five days later because of injuries she sustained in the fire. Many of the survivors were badly scarred, and they suffered health problems caused by the fire for the remainder of their lives. After leaving 10 people dead or dying, Hedin drove to a lake about three miles away from the nursing home. He ate a meal of sausages and wrote a suicide note. In the note, he confessed to starting the fire at the brewery when he was 16 and to killing Nielsen and stealing his money. He used the money to buy a new vehicle. He also confessed to the wake of devastation he had just caused. He also said he went on the killing spree because he lost his dream job. He wanted to be a cop and catch bad guys. He signed off the letter with the designation murderer. In the postscript of the suicide note, he said that he killed his parents because he didn't want them to live with the knowledge of what he had done. Hadeen's body was found weighted down with rocks in the lake the next day. Horadine's rampage is the worst mass murder and killing spree in modern Swedish history. Number 1. Edward Lutz Edward Lutz joined the Seaside Heights, New Jersey Police Department in the mid-1980s and he was a decorated officer. He had a meticulous record and he was the department's weapons expert. He was also assigned to the department's special assault team. Lutz lived in Toms River, New Jersey, and he was divorced from his wife. He won custody of his daughter, Sarah, and he was raising her alone. Edward became close with several of his neighbors in his middle-class neighborhood. His neighbors who lived across the street, Dominic and Gail Galliano, babysat Sarah on mornings that Edward had to work. In the late 1990s, Edward met Cindy Mansway and they started dating. Not long after they started dating, Cindy and her three children moved in with Edward and Sarah. In March 1999, Edward accused his neighbor, Dominic Galliano, of exposing himself to Sarah, who was eight at the time, while he was babysitting her. Edward filed charges not long afterwards. The allegations shocked the close-knit neighborhood. In the two years that it took for the case to go to trial, the people in the neighborhood started to take sides. Some people believed the Lutz, while other people thought that Dominic was innocent. The Williams family, who lived next door to Edward, thought that Sarah was lying. The main reason they believed she was lying was because Edward's girlfriend, Cindy, apparently told Tina Williams that she thought that Sarah wasn't being truthful. Edward was incredibly protective of his daughter 
and he refused to even consider the possibility that Sarah was lying. And he considered anyone who even suggested that she was lying to be his enemy. Tina's husband, Gary Williams, testified as a character witness for Dominic at his trial in January 2001. The district attorney had no physical evidence or witnesses besides Sarah proving that any crime had been committed. The jury deliberated for an hour before acquitting Dominic of all charges. The verdict enraged Edward. When Dominic returned home after the trial, Edward screamed at him that he would have his day. Two months after the trial, Cindy, who was now Edward's fiance, was tragically killed. Her car collided with a school bus when she was on her way home from picking up her wedding dress. Edward took the loss of his fiance hard and he began to drink heavily. He also developed a gambling addiction and he was finding himself more in debt every day. Over the next year, anytime Edward would see the Gallianos or the Williams, he would yell insults or swear at them. The Williams had the tires on their car slashed three times and someone had thrown paint on one of their cars. The Gallianos also had their cars vandalized. The police never followed up on the vandalism. The families thought that the police weren't doing anything because Edward was a fellow officer. A few weeks later, Edward set up a projector to project a message onto the front of his house so that his message faced the Gallianos. In big bold letters, the message said, Every dad has his day. Edward's behavior at work had also changed. Edward was angry because he didn't receive a promotion he wanted and he felt underappreciated. Then on February 21st, 2002, the police were called to a neighborhood in Tom's River because there had been a mass shooting involving a former police officer. The shooter was arrested and identified as 72-year-old John Maybe. Maybe had been an officer with the Newark Police Department and he retired in 1976 with a disability pension. People who knew him said that he was haunted by an accident that happened in 1971. He was off duty and driving a station wagon when he struck an 11 year old boy who was driving a go-kart that careened into traffic. It was a tragic accident and the boy's parents never blamed Maybe for his death. Sadly, the boy's mother died by suicide two years later. The accident, although not his fault, racked Maybe with guilt for years. When he retired, he became a bit of a recluse and his mental health took a turn for the worse. On February 21st, 2002, he locked his wife in the basement of their home. He grabbed his 38 caliber revolver and walked down the road to his mother-in-law's home. When he got inside the home, he fatally shot his favorite granddaughter, 22-year-old Natalie Gingerelli. He then forced his 90-year-old mother-in-law to come with him to the home of Susan Kieran, another neighbor. He had his mother-in-law ring the doorbell, and then when Kieran answered the door, he aimed a gun at her. Kieran said, God loves you, and then maybe shot her twice. He left her to die in the doorway of her house. Maybe returned home, and he picked up some ammunition. He then went to the home of Thomas Luster and Suzanne Lavicia. They were both 27, and they were engaged to be married. Their wedding was just four months away. Maybe shot Luster five times, and he shot Lavicia four times, and then she fell face down. He stood over her and fired three more shots into her back. He then surrendered and confessed to the murders, but he didn't give a motive for his killing spree. It's suspected that he killed those neighbors because he thought they were noisy, but the police aren't certain about that. It's also not clear why he chose that day to go on his killing spree. 
The shooting happened about a mile away from where Edward Lutz lived. Edward talked about the shooting, and it was clear that he empathized with Maybe. He said that he understood Maybe's need to lash out in rage. On April 9, 2002, a few months after John Maybe shot and killed four people in Tom's River, Edward Lutz armed himself with his department-issued MP5 submachine gun. First, he walked across the street to the Galliano's home. He rang the doorbell, and the couple's son, 25-year-old Christopher, opened the door. When he did, Edward opened fire on him, striking him several times. Gail, who was 49, came to the door to see what the loud noise was, and Edward shot her as well. Then Edward tracked down Dominic. Dominic was shot more than anyone else. The Williams family had no idea that there was a shooting happening across the road. Teresa Williams, who is Tina and Gary's adult daughter, left her family's home to go get some food. While she was gone, Edward burst through the front door of the Williams' home. He found 46-year-old Tina Williams sitting on the couch, and he opened fire on her. He then turned the gun on her husband Gary and shot him as well. Tina and Gary's son, Robert, escaped the shooting by jumping out of a second story window. Edward ran from the house and he fled in his pickup truck. 911 was called, but it was too late for the victims. They were all pronounced dead at the scene. James Costello, the chief of police in Seaside Heights, and Edward's boss was alerted about the shooting and he was walking out of his home to his vehicle when he spotted Edward's truck. Edward sprayed bullets at him and he was struck three times. After shooting his boss, Edward drove away. Costello was rushed to the hospital and he survived. Edward was found the next day in his truck that was parked in the driveway of a home that he seemingly picked at random. He had taken his own life by shooting himself. Before he died, Edward called his daughter Sarah and left a voicemail saying that he killed all the bad people in her life. He also said that since he was a police officer, he couldn't go to prison. John Maybe, who killed his granddaughter and three neighbors, pleaded guilty and he was sentenced to 30 years of prison. Thank you so much for watching today's video. If you liked it, please subscribe for more videos just like it. Please don't forget to visit criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases and buy merchandise. Please also check out our Patreon page where you can get access to an exclusive podcast. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.